Now there's quite a few things we need to do in order to get these kicks to really work together as well as possible. But before I get into them, I need you to understand something related to phase first. Now, if I zoom in here on the sampler, this is the waveform, the phase of this specific kick sample. This is the phase of the second kick sample and the phase of the third kick sample. Now, what this essentially represents is simply how the speaker cone is going to push and pull in order to generate this sound. Now, positive polarity, so that's when the waveform goes up, means the speaker is pushing. Negative polarity means the speaker is pulling. Now, this is very, very important, and I'm going to show you right away why. So I'm going to leave the sampler for a second. We're going to go back to the arrangement view. And I'm going to drag two of the same kick samples into the arrangement page, one above the other. Now, if I zoom in, you'll see their phase is identical because they are the exact same sample. However, what if the phase of one of them was flipped? So instead of, let's say, at this point going down, it would go up. Well, I can show you what this would look like by flipping it using a plugin. If I go to audio effects, to the utility plugin, I'm going to drop it onto this track. And where it says input, left and right, I can invert the phase of both the left and right channels. So this is with the phase normal. And this, even though we can't visually see it, is with the phase flipped. exactly the same sound. Now, what matters is what happens when the phase of one sound interacts with the phase of another similar sound. So here we've got two identical kick drums, so the exact same sample. If one of them has its phase flipped, so I'm going to actually flatten it so that you can see it visually represented, this is also known as polarity inversion. So if the, if the phase or polarity has been flipped, we're going to get total phase cancellation, which means no sound whatsoever. Now I've soloed both of these samples, and if I unsolo one of them and solo just one, we're going to hear it normally. If I solo both so that they're both trying to play back, they cancel each other out. Now, there's a very important reason for this. It's because they are both trying to feed their phase to the same output device, to the same speaker, let's say, and they're playing tug of war with each other. So this sample is telling the speaker to pull its cone back at this point, or sorry, push its cone forward at this point, whilst the other sample is telling it to do the exact opposite at the exact same frequency. And therefore, we get what's known as 100% phase cancellation. Now, the moment that they are not 100% opposites of each other, we start to regenerate a little bit of our original kick sound. Let me move them to slightly different positions so you can hear the results. And then full phase cancellation. Now this can also be known as comb filtering. The only reason why that would be the case is because, I'll just show you. If you look at an EQ here, the um, frequency analyzer, Right now, we've got nothing going on whatsoever because they're cancelling each other out. As soon as I move this a little bit, then this is the frequency response. And then if I solo just one, that's the frequency response. The reason why it's known as comb filtering is because sometimes when you have some phase cancellation occurring, you get peaks and troughs in a frequency analyzer, which can look like a comb, essentially. And what this basically means is that some of the frequencies, 
the sound is generating are adding up with the frequencies of the other sample and therefore doubling in volume. However, other frequencies are being cancelled out and therefore halving in volume or being muted completely. And that's why you get peaks and troughs in a frequency analyzer. Let's make it slightly more high definition. You can see them a little bit more now. So why is this important? Well, it's important because when you're layering samples, so if we go back to our drum rack, I'm going to quickly create a MIDI region and I'm going to insert a kick on every beat. I'm going to copy it so that all three kick samples are triggering the kick. I'm going to solo the drum rack, so all we're going to hear is the kick. And I'm going to loop this one bar of the kick drum. Now, all three together sound like this. Let me reduce the tempo as well. That's, that's not really a house tempo. That would be more side trance, closer to drum and bass, something like that. Okay, now what if I add a utility plugin to one of the kick drums and I invert the phase? You'll notice that there may be a drastic change in our overall sound. Let's have a listen. Yeah. Pay close attention. So what's happening is, with the original phase, we're getting more of a click sound. When we invert the phase, we lose that click, but the low frequencies are a little bit tighter. They're not as loose. Listen once more. And make sure you're listening on a good stereo system, on good monitors, or on good headphones. That's how you'll really hear the difference between the two. Now, it doesn't always mean that if you invert the phase of one of the samples, it's automatically going to sound better. But you must always try because you can never be sure as to whether the phase of one of your kicks is going to be almost completely out of phase with the other kick. So going on to step one of what you must do once you've chosen your samples. Once you've chosen your samples, add a utility plugin and invert the phase of one of them and A, B, so that you check whether it sounds better with the phase inverted or without the phase inverted. And this is a method you must use. First, you pick the two samples that are closest together in sound. So our mid range and our low sample. You add a utility or a phase inversion plugin on only one of the samples. So in Ableton, it's very important you don't add a utility plugin here because that would invert the phase of everything that's being put into the drum rack. So it would invert the phase of all three simultaneously and therefore you wouldn't be checking the phase correlation between the two. So you must input the you must insert the plugin purely right next to the kick drums waveform. That means that this plugin will only affect the kick drum on this sample here. Then you can click on the second kick and you see how now that utility plugin has disappeared. Now, once you've inserted the phase inversion utility plugin on one of the kicks, you can either mute one of the three or solo two of them, press play and A, B the plugin in and out. Once, you, once you've selected your desired you know, version, so with the plugin on, with the phase and version on, or without. Then you add the third plugin in, so we, the third sample, sorry, you solo the third sample, you add a utility plugin on that one as well, invert the phase, and A, B that one with it on or off. So I feel with the utility plugin phase inversion on on this one, we're getting more of a transient. Listen closely. It 
it's minor, but it's there. So that's step number one. Now, in other um, samplers, such as battery by Native Instruments, there is a phase inversion button directly on the sampler. Let me show you right here. So on any sample, we could load a, let's just load this for now. You could invert the phase simply by clicking there. Okay. Now the next step we're going to look at is going to be using filters to really get rid of all the frequencies we don't need in our samples so that the low kick is prominently on the low frequencies, the mid-range kick is primarily on the mid frequencies and the high kick doesn't have any low frequencies being produced and therefore conflicting with the frequencies of our other two samples. And we're going to look at that in the next video.